I'd like for you to turn with me to Luke 10. <clears throat> Sometimes when we preach from one of the most familiar passages, we tend to just slide over it and not really take it seriously. But this is a very important passage. Please understand, if you will, that Luke has a uniqueness to his gospel. Uh, if you look at the birth stories of Jesus, you'll see that it's the story of Mary telling what happened at the birth of Jesus. Luke is very careful to get Mary's story and include it in his gospel. And the phrases when he writes to us, and Mary treasured these things in her heart, he's actually telling us she knew things about Jesus not many people knew. And Luke saves those precious gems for us and holds them in his testimony for us to ponder and think about. This is one of those special stories. Luke is the only one who tells about this event. And I believe it comes somehow directly through the person of the mother of Jesus. I want you to think about this for just a second. If Luke treasured the words of Mary and the story that she told of what happened to Jesus, and this is a story that is unique to his gospel, I want you to think about the connection between the two. All right, so I'm going to start with that. All right? Starting with verse 25, Luke 10, 25. On one occasion, an expert of the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all of your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You can answer correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes and beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going along the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. And he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring out oil and wine, Then he and the man put the man on his own donkey, and took him to the inn to take care of him. The next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return I will reimburse you for any extra expense that you might have. Now which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert of the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. <coughs> the sermon this morning is entitled, Having a Lifestyle of Compassion. A Lifestyle of Compassion. We don't become born into this world, existence into this world, with compassionate heart. Have you ever thought of a child, five years old, who worried that they might be too much of a burden on their mother? Too much expense to their father? Too much of a burden for grandma and grandpa to get down on the floor and roll around and play with them? No, they want you on the floor playing with them no matter whether it hurts you or doesn't. I'm going to do that in a little while down in Phoenix, so I'm getting my knees already worked up, you know. <laughs> No, it, we don't have compassion as a part of our normal working 
full grown adult capacity. Where does it come from? It is a learned quality. It is something that is developed within us as we become sensitized to what the needs are of people around us. It's something that we grow into. It's something we have to experience to be able to share. Um, I'm going to tell you a quick story if I can. A week ago I got word that J.D. Miller, a very good friend in uh, Bradenton, where we live, been a member of the church, been a part of the church for a number of years. He's uh, better at hand and foot playing cards than I am, so he carries me when we have our evenings together. I carry him when it comes to euchre, he carries me in hand and foot. 51 years old. He had a stroke. Down close to the base of the skull. They found it was a tangle of blood vessels. And somewhere in that there was a, a blood clot or something that happened and he was in very serious condition. The pastor had left their congregation recently, and he cried out and said, and here I am without even a pastor to help encourage me. And of course they said, well, call up my up. You know, when he's still there on the other end of the telephone. So we've talked several times and prayed together numerous times. And He called me yesterday. It's been an incredible week. He was back to being his old robust talking himself and he still slurs his speech and he still has some problems. He can't swallow anything and he's got some things he's still working on. But he'd just been transferred to a rehab facility. And while we were talking, I shared with him what I was going to share with you today. And I said, you have been given a tremendous gift, J.D. Miller. You have been given a tremendous gift. When you walk into that exercise room and you start working those arms and legs and you start taking the, the practice to swallow, I want you to look around the room and see someone who needs a word of encouragement from you. Well, the person who's usually recovering from a stroke is more concerned about themselves than they are somebody else in the room. It just sort of goes with the territory. Oh my, I may not ever get everything back. Oh my, what happens if I can't go back to my job? Oh my, what's going to happen to the family? Oh my, what's going to happen to this? What's going to happen? No, that's not the way it's supposed to work. I know that's the way it works for a lot of us. But this is a way that God prepares us to be more useful in His service. Look around. You know what it feels like to be weak. You know what it feels like to be near death. You know what it feels like to not know whether there's going to be any hope for you. Find somebody who has the same fear and help them. You know the fact about it? He will heal faster. He will get better quicker. He will be stronger in the end. He will be a better man. If he develops and uses this experience in a way to bless people with a lifestyle of compassion. You have the same need. You have the very same issue. No matter whether you recognize it or not, God has blessed you with all kinds of problems. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. I have heart problems. Thank you, Lord. I have knee problems. Oh, 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 my, oh, my. Thank you, Lord. I have breathing problems. Thank you, Lord. Oh, I'm not just pretending. I'm not making a foolish gesture here. Realize God brings us to this point so we can understand what someone right next to us that we never really have seen needs us to understand 
and share with them. But I'm divorced. Oh, my. What's my life going to be like? Thank you, Lord. I needed this to be able to understand what life is like so that I could see the need of others around me. Oh, Lord, I have this child that's sick. I don't know what I'm going to do. Thank you, Lord. You have given me a sensitive heart to know what somebody else is thinking and feeling. What does that have to do with the Good Samaritan? <laughs> I'll tell you what. In my heart, this is a story that happened to Jesus. He was the one laying beaten and bruised, abandoned by his friends, abandoned by his brothers, left for dead. And Mary knew it and told Luke about it. You see, we think of Jesus being the perfect son, the ideal son. But he wasn't really. He was a weird duck. You read any of the scriptures. You remember the story of him being 12 years old, going to the temple? And for three days, he's away from his mother and father while he's teaching and sharing with the elders in the temple? You think that's normal? His whole community, the entire community of Nazareth had come down together for the, the, the celebrations at the temple. And when they got ready and the celebrations were over, they headed back toward Nazareth. The whole crew. Mary and Joseph thought he was with the kids, his buddies. Didn't see him for a day. Finally, they didn't find him, and he had to go back. They had to go back to Jerusalem, and, and they looked all over the city. They went to Disneyland, and they went to SeaWorld, and they went to all of the great places that a kid would want to hang out, right? The fun places, the miniature golf. Wouldn't you look there first? Where'd they find him? You know what that tells me? Jesus didn't fit in really. I don't think they liked him very much. I don't think they really appreciated him very much. I think they might have humiliated him more than anybody else that lived in that community. I think they teased him unmercifully. I think they bullied him. I think they threatened him. You know why? Because when his ministry began to happen, he looked out and saw those who had been treated the same way he had been treated and had compassion on them. <coughs> now I know. I'm going way out on him. And you're going to say, Pastor Bob, I think you've really cooked the books on this one. Mm -hmm. All right? No, I haven't. Jesus went back to his hometown, we're told, and he went into the synagogue where he'd grown up. And on one particular Sabbath day, he opened that up and he rolled out the scroll and he began to read from Isaiah. I've come to preach the good news. And he went through the scripture reading. And he turned to his friends and he says, today this has been fulfilled in your hearing. Isn't that great? Aren't you excited about that? Isn't that good news? I'm here to tell you that I'm the one who's going to be able to do this for you. And they got so mad at him, they said, you mean the carpenter's son? They didn't call him by name. They didn't call him what he was given by God as his identifying name. They said, you mean that kooky carpenter's son? And they dragged him out of the synagogue and carried him over to the cliff of the hill upon which Nazareth is built. And were going to throw him over the side of the cliff. 
Do you think they liked him? Do you think they respected him? Do you think they enjoyed having him around? That wasn't the first time he'd seen the edge of the cliff. I want you to know, Jesus knew what it was like to be beaten up on the side of the road. My friends, you know this better than just about anybody else I've ever known. All right? You have an eagerness to help those who are in need better than just about any congregation I've ever dealt with. It's partly because you had to learn it the hard way. Jerusalem to Jericho is a road that's 15 miles long. And it comes straight down the side of a mountain. In the span of 15 miles, it drops 3,400 feet in elevation. And it's windy. And it's twisty. And it's lonely. Nobody wants to go down that road. Nobody wants to go down that road alone. There are places uh, as steep as coming down the Ochiko Road, and there are gorges as deep as what you're going to run in through, down through El Dorado, and all those switchbacks and things out there. They're not as deep as the Pitcher Gorge, but you know, I mean, you can just visualize people jumping out behind rocks in all directions and robbing you. It's one of those places that was known as the Valley of the Shadow of Death. You know where that comes from? It comes right here from the road to Jericho. It's not a happy place, and there's not a lot of traffic. And if you had three people come by, you had a busy day. <laughs> because everybody wanted to avoid this road. And if you went down the road, you went in large groups to try and protect each other. Because it was so dangerous and it was so difficult. I've never been in a place where people were more eager, quick, to stop and help someone stranded on the road than you guys are. Because you have to. When the weather's bad and things get tough, if somebody slips off the road up here someplace, it could be a long time for another person to come along to help. You know what it's like. You know why? I'm going to dwell on another limb. Because you've been there more than once. And somebody had to come along and help you. You were stuck bad enough, you couldn't get out yourself. You were in trouble. Jesus knew what it was like to be stuck all by himself. And hoping that someone would come along who put aside every one of those normal things to say, he doesn't look like me, he doesn't appear to be one of my buddies or my friends. I don't recognize him. He's not one of my clan. There's a degree of risk involved in it, but I'm going to stop and help, and I'm going to do what it takes. <clears throat> that is a lifestyle of compassion. When we take our own hurts or our own suffering, and we make it a part of who we are to help those who are also in need. In the middle of the road, somewhere about halfway down the slope, there is a flat spot in the road that goes from Jerusalem to Jericho. They have a place on it just about like the Austin house out here. Place you can stop and rest and grab a drink. Because you see, there's no vegetation out there. There's no trees or any place. There's no shade. It's a hot desert, barren land. I've been down the road. I was in a tour bus. I wasn't walking, but then, you know, you hit What a refreshing. It was almost like a hospital. Because you just about have enough strength to make it there 
And if you don't get refreshed, it's going to be tough making it the rest of the way without it. I can't tell you to love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said, go and do likewise. But we're blinded if we haven't already seen the need, if we haven't felt the need. We're blinded by our own self-interest to basically say, well, it really doesn't impact on me. Most of the other communities I've lived in, they drive by a wreck on the side of the road and never even stop and think about stopping to help somebody. Too many other people, they get to the idea of saying, well, somebody else will stop. Not my problem. I have other important things to do. Jesus wasn't criticizing the priest or the Levite. He was just saying, people, you have to have a sensitivity. I, I want to share with you just, just this one thought. If you happen to be struggling right now and so say, why are these bad things happening to me? Why are we having so many difficulties? Why does it seem that I've got this, this struggle to get back on top of things? Maybe it's God's way of saying, I want you to listen to how you might be able to use that to encourage someone. You see, Jesus knew well enough that there was going to be a time when even his own 12 disciples would stand off to the side and watch him be crucified. He knew full well that was going to happen. He knew Peter was going to <coughs> deny him. And the rest were going to run away. But do you know what he said to Peter? The most helpful, hopeful words in Scripture. The very best thing he ever said to Peter. When you have returned. When you have faced your failure and your rejection of me, when you have recognized what you have done, when you hear that cock crow in the morning, when you finally come back, use that experience to encourage your brothers. He wanted us to use even the things that are not fun about our lives to lift up those around us who are also strong. 